Okay, uh, good evening again. We are now going to go back on our syllabus sheet, our curriculum, and we're going to pick up at Roman numeral two, letter B, number seven. So up until now, in the last classes, we've talked about the Sabbath, we've talked about Shabbat, we've talked about the positive mitzvot, the positive obligations to Shabbat, that it should be a sacred day and an enjoyable day and a pleasant day and a pleasurable day. And we talked about the various restrictions, the forbidden activities, all of the late categories of labor that are uh, forbidden on Shabbat, like you know, uh, picking fruit from a tree and, and cooking and uh, grinding grain and lighting a fire and all of these 39 uh, categories of labor. Um, be, however, those categories of labor don't actually um, fully uh, like ensure that Shabbat will be a tranquil uh, and pleasant and um, in a relaxing, enjoyable day, right? Because um, for a couple of reasons. One is those categories of labor, they're very agricultural. And for those of us who aren't farmers, we might like, we might never plow or reap or winnow, right? When was the last time you winnowed? Probably, right? I suspect it was a long time ago, right? So, so Shabbat might be like not so different from a weekday if, you know, you don't, I don't winnow during the week. I don't winnow on Shabbat. Um, I've actually never winnowed in my life as far as I know, right? Um, so, so the labors are, are, are not necessarily so, so relevant to like things that, that distinguish a weekday from a day of rest for us. Uh, and so that's, we talked about, I think last time, the category of muktza, we're not supposed to like handle money or handle um, things that are really for weekday purposes. Um, but um, uh, so that, that, that's the mukta category that we talked about that last time. Also, we're not supposed to do things that entail tircha, that entail physical strain on Shabbat. So um, that would mean, I don't know, like moving heavy furniture around your apartment, okay? Is that one of the 39 categories of labor? Probably not, okay? Dragging a bench on, on, some, on some dirt, make a groove in the dirt, that would be a forbidden form of labor. Or carrying something outdoors in a public domain, right? That would be a forbidden form of labor, one of the 39 categories of labor. But I just schlepping a, you know, a big heavy box up and down the stairs in your building, uh, that's not a forbidden category of labor. So tircha is a additional restriction, like really above and beyond the 39 categories of labor that Shabbat should be um, a restful day, a tranquil day. We don't do things that are like straining uh, and should be a Shabbaton, right? Shabbaton is the language that Torah uses, like a Sabbath day, okay? Ramban, the Chmanides, the medieval uh, rabbi says that this means that again, above and beyond the 39 categories of labor, we have to make sure that the Sabbath day is a, um, is a tranquil day, is a restful day, especially. I, I think this is so much more relevant today than, than, it, than it ever was because um, the, the things that make our, that distinguish work from rest, uh, the way that we, most of us are productive, do productive labor during the week, it's not through the old 39 categories of labor. We don't winnow, right? We don't plow. Uh, you know, maybe we do a little bit right, in some way, but like, that, that's not the main way that we're productive. It's not the main way that we exert ourselves and transform the world during the six days of the week. Um, and so refraining from those things on Shabbat um, is not um, going to set the day apart, as I mentioned that before. Furthermore, it's possible you, you could do all the things you want. You could just set up... Um, you know, with, with electronic timer, computerized, you know, you, you could make all sorts of things and have the whole economic, you know, process go. You push a button on Friday and everything is done automatically, right? So, so you really, um, you, you can use technology in ways now to kind of circumvent all of these 39 categories of labor. So the Ramban, Nachmanri says that when the Torah says Shabbaton, the Torah uses this language of Shabbaton to describe the Sabbath, you, know, you really have to like make sure it's a restful day, okay? Don't get too caught up in the minutia of, of the technical details that you forget the, the basic obligation that, um, uh, the basic obligation that it should be a restful day. Um, so, so, so that's, um, um, I, I think it's a very important part. So for me, I, I'd say like the, for me and, and like, you know, I would, I would say, uh, um, the clearest example of this is the use of electronic communication devices, cell phones, computers, right. Being on the internet, et cetera. It's not obvious that there's any malacha, there's any like technical violation of the Sabbath to use a phone, surf the internet. 
but it, it's like the main thing we do during the week. It's the main way that we are productive and, and, and transform the world and, and engage in recreation during the week. And, and for me, like just turning off my computer, putting away my phone uh, on Friday afternoon, that, that's when I feel the rest. That's how I know like I'm entering into a different kind of time. Uh, and that just, that time feels different. Uh, and I think, you know, this is, I, I, I um, maybe it's hyperbole, but I, I think refraining from using electronic communication devices on the Sabbath may be the most like distinctive, like feature of Orthodox Judaism, like uh, of, of any other, like, you know, way of life that exists on the planet, right? That we we have these periods of, you know, holidays and, and Sabbaths where we don't use phones and electronic communications. and. You know, and that, that sets us apart, I think, from other Jewish groups. It sets us apart from other religions. I, I think it's a, I don't know, this is what we have to offer to the world. I, I think it's so valuable. I think it's so precious. Um, and, and I think this is absolutely, you know, in line with what the Torah says, that it should be a Shabbaton, which is, which according to the Ramban is, again, don't be so caught up, you know, you know, which of the 39 categories of labor when, when I'm using my phone, am I, am I I'm not lighting a fire? I'm not plowing, I'm not completing a circuit. What am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm something different. But by and large, Sabbath observant Jews have refrained from manipulating electricity from the invention of electricity until today. And I think it, like every year, that seems to become more and more important. Uh, I guess the flip side is you can be lenient with maybe interactions with electricity that really are more consistent with the Sabbath. Like I, I think there's room for leniency if your uh, if your hotel room has an electronic key. And I, I don't think using the car to unlock a door is not a malacha, it's not one of the 39 categories of labor, according to many um, rabbinic scholars. Um, and it's not inconsistent with having a Sabbath experience, a Shabbos experience, a restful day. Um, so I think there's maybe room for, you know, uh, even for leniency in some ways, but I think, uh, you know, not using electronic communication devices, I think really, really that's my that's my editorial comment, okay? Uh, but I, I, I believe in it. So I, I try it. If you haven't tried it, try it, I, I think. Um, but I'll say, it. You actually do oh, it's one more thing. You do some, there, there is like a movement, there's like a digital Sabbath kind of movement. There are people, some Jewish, some non-Jewish, who are like advocating, you know, spending a day of the week where you don't use your cell phone. Like it's a thing. They're like, you know, it's like a trendy, you know, kind of lifestyle thing that you find people advocating. And they say, like, what's really hard about it is that it's really hard to meet up with friends without your using your phone. Like, you know, one guy says, Yeah, my wife, she she uses her phone and she calls the people we're meeting up with at the park so we can, you know, know where to go or the movie we go to is, you know, you know, like it's very hard to be by yourself and just like decide I'm not going to use my phone if you're in the midst of um, like your regular, you know, non-Jewish, like secular, like kind of environment. Um, it's much, much more easy to do it in the context of the community where everyone is doing it, right? If everyone knows that none of us are going to be using our cell phones, so we just make our plans in advance. Uh, that, and we make plans that don't involve cell phones, right? Like uh, I'm trying to, you know, like we were invited for lunch, yes, last Saturday afternoon. So we arranged with our hosts that we would, you know, meet up with them at the synagogue. And after prayers ended, we would walk home to their house. But my, one of my sons finished early. He went to an earlier service, like the eight o'clock service. He was done. So he went to go home and relax. So he went home and relaxed and he didn't come back in time for us to go to lunch. So I sent my, his twin brother like to the apartment to meet him. And then I told them the address where we were all going. Now they had also planned to meet up with a, another friend of theirs in the afternoon at 3.30, you know, and I told them, you know, the apartment where he was eating his lunch. And so we all made up, met up eventually at the place we were eating lunch. And then they ate quickly and they went to meet their friend at the apartment where he told them he would be having his lunch. It was just fine, you know, and then we all met up at our home later. It was fine. It was fine, right? Um, we did it without cell phones. We just knew that none of us were going to be using our phones. So we all had to just share the information. Here's one meeting lunch. And uh, I'll be here from this time to this hour. And then this other friend, I think, wants to play basketball with us. So we'll go meet him at the playground. And we're all coming back to home for dinner, you know. Um, it, it's really fine. And, and it's very easy when an entire community is doing it. And also, it just means an entire community is available, right? All of the friends, all of the no one's going shopping, no one's driving to visit, you know, somebody in a different neighborhood. Everyone's around, everyone's at home, or they're available to socialize and be with people over the course of the afternoon.
<laughs> I think I've spoken about that before. Like it's very hard, things that are very, very hard to do by yourself become very, very easy when you're like ensconced in a community that's all on that same rhythm, doing it in the same way. And I think Sabbath observance in all of its details and you know, from the bigger to the small, I think it really works that way. All right, questions, comments? I, I, I there's a lot of editorializing on my part. Any questions or comments before we go on? Okay, let's go on then. All right. Um, eight and nine transfer. Okay, transfer between areas on Shabbat, right? So you're not. Um, um, this is actually this is one of the transports. You mean what? What, I, what is? What do I mean by transport? Um, well, we don't carry on, on, on Shabbat, right? That's one of the that's one of the 39 categories of labor is carrying from a private to a public domain or from a public domain to a private domain, meaning from the street to your house, from your house to the street, or more than six feet in a public area in a street. Um, now, it, it seems that the Talmud gives very, very um, specific, um, um, what do you call it, specific um, definitions of public and private domain. And it turns out that the definition of a public domain as it's found in the Talmud and developed in the medieval commentaries, a public domain is actually uh, very, very public, like a massive thoroughfare, a huge plaza where hundreds of thousands of people congregate. Uh, we generally don't have those in, in uh, most of our neighborhoods uh, today. Um, and when we do, they're divided, there are traffic lights, there's all sorts of things breaking them up. Uh, and so uh, most of our neighborhoods don't have these like biblical public domains. And so carrying, in most of our neighborhoods is really only rabbinic prohibition. Since it's a rabbinic prohibition, not, a, not the full biblical prohibition, we get around it by building an Eruv. I don't know if it's a word you're familiar with, an Eruv is a symbolic merging of all the domains. So we say this, this public domain um, is really, let, 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 let's, let's, here, let's, let's say we have two neighbors and we share a courtyard, okay? Two homes and two neighbors, we share a courtyard. So I can't, Essentially, you know, the, the basic law is I can't bring anything to your house. You can't carry into my house because you're two separate domains. I can't bring something from domain to domain. And the courtyard in between is also like, a, you know, I can't bring from there into the house, into either house either. But let's take, if we take some food that we commonly own and we put it in one of our, let's say my, on a shelf in my, my home. So this food belongs to both of us. So you can come into my house to take the food because it belongs to you as well. And since you can come to my house, so presumably I can come to your house. We sort of merge our two homes and the courtyard in between by means of this food that we own in common, okay? So now we can expand that, not just like two homes with a courtyard, but what about an entire neighborhood, okay? There's food that's owned in common. The entire neighborhood can share it. And so therefore we can all go into each other's homes and, um, and therefore and carry from what, you know, into each other's homes uh, on the Sabbath because we're sort of merging all of our private domains into one giant, a private domain for this to work the area has to have a boundary like a wall or you know something like that so we use little wires and we you know put them on telephone poles and that way we construct a wall around the entire neighborhood and most jewish communities in north america um, certainly in israel uh, have these boundaries right now and so you can carry on the sabbath but the essential way to observe the sabbath is not to carry through this mechanism in neighborhoods where it's possible uh, it is it is possible to carry so this also serves to like kind of help Jewish communities stay cohesive because you need, it's like a piece of communal infrastructure that is not so easy to build and not so easy to maintain. And so once you have one, you wanna, you, you wanna, you wanna you know, buy your house in the, where the Arab exists, right? Um, and, and, and live in proximity to other Jews and proximity to the synagogue. And it's, not, it's also serves to kind of keep Jewish communities together. Uh, but otherwise you don't, we don't transfer from one area to the next. Um, we, we also have a tomb, we also have a, a boundary. This, this is very rarely, it's not relevant in most American like urban or suburban neighborhoods, but you're not allowed to walk more than 2,000 cubits, which is about 3,000 feet outside of a settled area. Okay, so if you imagine like there's a, imagine like a, like a rustic village. Okay, and there's the village, and outside the village is like the forest. Okay, so you can't leave the village and walk, you know, into the forest um, 3,000 feet in any direction, okay? More than 3,000 feet in any direction, okay? That's the basic rule. Now, I, I think most places, most like developed parts of where we live, you know, it's like city goes to a suburb, goes to another suburb, goes to another city. Like you sort of walk for days and days and days and never reach an unsettled area. But if you imagine like a more like traditional way of like kind of landscape where there's settled area and then there's, there's outside the settled area and maybe it's a bit easier to kind of understand like what 
what that what that concept means. And again, if you stay where you are on the Sabbath, okay, you know, when, when the sun sets on Friday, you have your food's ready, your home is ready, the body's ready, okay, and you're not going anywhere, uh, you're not carrying anything, you're not shaping the world, right? You have one day to like live in the world as God created it. One day to live in the world as you've shaped it during those six days, but then you know, no, no, no further, no further shaping. Questions, comments. So you couldn't like go for a hike on Shabbat, for example, in a large park? Yeah, so that would be kind of hard, right? To go for a hike, you, you'd have to um, keep your hike um, confined to 3000 feet from your starting place. You could um, you could walk up very far just as long as you didn't like, I mean, that would be your radius. Your radius would be 3000 feet around your starting point, which would be, you could do some hiking, but not, not so much. I, I've, won I've often wondered, but is it possible to like for a Sabbath observant Jew to like complete the Appalachian Trail or something? It's like my uh, sort of years ago when I was younger and had ambitions to do such things. I, I wonder whether it was possible because, you know, you, you know, basically when, you know, if you'd have to one day of seven, you'd have to kind of like stay where you are and not, you know, stay in your lean to wherever you happen to be. Uh, so, so hiking is not a great, like taking a Sabbath stroll down a country lane or down the streets of your neighborhood, very appropriate, going to a park and strolling and walking, very appropriate, uh, Sabbath activity hiking uh, would be, would be less so. I think when you go camping over the set, you know, you know, you, you bring a book and then Shabbat is the day you sit and read and then the other days are the days when you, when, when you hike, um, in, in, as a general rule, uh, but Depending on the area, maybe there, you know, if it's like surrounded by homes and you're sort of in a, you're hiking through a more developed area, then, then it might be possible to do real hiking as well. Is it hard to shovel snow on the sidewalk during winter start during the shade? Yeah, in general it is. Oh, because it's like carrying? Yeah. So let's so if there is an area for sure you could carry um, like the snow in your shovel to smooth it aside. If there's no Arif, could you like pick up the snow and dump it? Yeah, it's probably better to wait until after the Sabbath, right? They generally give you 24 hours to clear your sidewalk. Um, it was like a safety issue. It's not necessarily so safe to do nothing for 20, you know, it's harder to, uh, generally, I, generally we wait until Sabbath is over to, to shovel, but other than the, if there is an area, I don't believe there's any like, well, you're, not, you're not digging into the ground. You're just like the snow is on top of the ground and you're setting it aside to facilitate walking. So I think it's, I think it's permissible in an area without an area, if there's one of these devices then the carrying itself would be a problem. Like even carrying the shovel, right? Would be a problem, right? So you definitely can't carry, you definitely can't shovel outside of an area because how could you even carry the shovel, let alone the snow? If there is an area, I believe you can. So yeah, good question. Um, okay. Okay, letter C, communal stuff, right? So I sort of alluded to this before, so I'll say it again. The, the, um, the, um, we, we, we have this desire for the, for, for, for the day, um, again, to be sacred and special, and, and in order to do that, to make this you know, san sanctuary in time, we, 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 we carve out time through all of these restrictions, the prohibitions, the things we don't do, just like, I, I feel like, just like clawing back, pushing away all the things that, that could impede on this time. And, th and then that, that allows us to have this sacred time that we can invest in and do something positive in. Um, again, like Heschel called this the, the sanctuary in time, right? Because the Torah, talks about sacred space and this is sacred time, right? And um, I think we spoke about that before. So once we've done that, like what, what, what do we, what, what do we, what's that time available for? So it's available for sleeping and relaxing and recreation. It's available for spiritual growth, for prayer, uh, and Torah study and introspection. Um, but it's also available for community because everyone is, um, everyone's on the same schedule, right? I think, again, it's like, a, I said this three minutes ago, okay? But everyone's on the same schedule. It, it, it just transforms what it means to be going through these rituals and to be doing these things, right? Because again, like you, all your friends are gonna be home or 
everyone you know in your community is having lunch on Shabbat afternoon at their own home, right? Where they've had friends come over or they're going over to other friends' homes. So it's very easy. You can knock on the door and someone will be there and then we'll go to the park together after lunch, um, right? I My kids meet their friends in the synagogue Saturday morning and we, you know, some go home with their friends for lunch and we bring some others to our house for lunch and we're all, you know, and we can just return them to their house afterwards because everyone's gonna, everyone's home, everyone's available, right? Because everyone's doing it. So, so there's a real, the, the communal element of an entire congregation, entire community observing on the same ritual really, um, I, I think sort of makes it sustainable, makes it possible. There's research um, about this in the general population as well. I think there's research that unemployed people also experience anxiety, you know, Sunday night before Monday morning. <laughs> They also, right? So why should it make a difference if I'm unemployed? You know, well, why is Monday morning? Like, why am I depressed on Monday morning um, if I'm unemployed? Because on Monday morning, all their friends go off to work <laughs> and they're lonely, right? Whereas on the weekends, their friends are available. And they, right? Time is not um, undifferentiated, okay? Like an hour of Saturday is different from an hour of Thursday is different from an hour of Monday. Um, maybe we've lost that in modern America a little bit because we work from home and we shop at work. <laughs> we, you know, like we you know, do uh, kind of those two categories kind of bled into each other, but um, um, uh, all the same, I, I think it's true that uh, uh, that the time is um, is, that, is that all the same. And so, part of Shabbat is is that those communal elements. So I have here it says on the shul Musaf Kriyat okay, right? So there we, we come to shul on Shabbat. Like we can come to shul, we come to the synagogue every day. Like prayers take place in the synagogue three times every day, and it's wonderful to pray the synagogue, you know, not just on, on the Sabbath, but um, people make a special effort to come to the synagogue on Shabbat. People sometimes come a little bit late to the synagogue on Shabbat, and like, obviously better to come on time than to come late, but I, I think by coming late, they're saying, yeah, I'm here to pray, but I'm also here to be with my community. Like, once a week, the whole community should stand together, uh, right? That's like the Musaf prayer, right? We have an additional prayer on the Sabbath that takes place later, Shachrit, Mincha, Marav, morning, afternoon, evening, Prayers take place every day, but on on, um, on Shabbat we have and holidays we have Musaf, this extra prayer representing symbolic of the extra sacrifices offered in the temple, you know, in ancient times. But also, it's like okay, like this is not just something additional is happening today. This is when, like again, people just try. If I don't make it on time, I'm going to be in synagogue for this this special um, uh, this the special prayer. Um, and the Torah is read, right, on, on, on Shabbat as well. We read the Torah three times a week, also Monday, Thursday morning. Monday, Thursday morning, we read just for a few minutes. On Shabbat morning, we read 20, 30, 40 minutes of, of Torah reading. That's part of our, in the middle of our prayer service, being the morning service and the Musaf service, we read the Torah. So um, we read the Torah on Shabbat because that's when people gathered in the synagogue. And so we want them to hear Torah, but also like it becomes a way to orient an entire community's conversation, right? Because everyone's there and that's when the most people are there. And so that's when we're going to, Gather and read Torah. So, so it's um, so it's sort of cyclical, um, right? You can have a conversation with people about the weekly Torah portion because, right, like the highlight of the the Torah of the week is that we gather on Shabbat morning and we all hear the same Torah portion being read in all of our congregations. Uh, um, and the word, like you know, synagogue is a Greek word. I, I you know, Knesset in Hebrew. It means a place of assembly. It's like a communal gathering place. Like that's that's what the word means. It's part of what the institution is about. Um, not just a place of prayer, not just a place of study, a place of community coming together. And synagogues, the best synagogues try to instantiate that and, and exhibit that as, as well, what they do. Questions, comments? Let's... Uh... All right, let's move on to do letter three. Letter three, Roman numeral, uh, let, sorry, Roman numeral three, letter A. Okay, so time, okay, we've, sort of, we've been dancing around this. Um, um, time is sacred. Um, time has qualities, right? And each day is not like the next. Passover is different from Shavuot, which is different from Rosh Hashanah. Each day has its own identity um, that's set in the Torah. It says here, right, time is a spiral, not linear. It's not like we go from beginning to end. It's like we 
come back and back and back. Every Shabbat has, is connected to every other Shabbat. Every Rosh Hashanah is connected to every Rosh Hashanah. Every Passover is connected to every other Passover as we move forward through history. Um, like the days itself have identities. And that day itself is a, a combination of the identity of that day given in the Torah and also the human decision to endow these days with special sanctity, okay? That means, um, you know, that, uh, in ancient times, it means that the court, the Sanhedrin sitting in the temple would declare, yes, like I, that sliver of moon in the sky means that the new Hebrew month has begun and we'll start counting. 14 days later will be Passover, okay? So um, there's the human initiative as well, partnering with, the dates in the Torah itself, like God said, you know, on the fifteenth of day, fifteenth of Nisan is is, is going to be Passover, but we're the ones who say when Nisan comes because we have to see the moon in the sky and say yes, this is, um, uh, this this is the this is the new moon that it's it's occurred. Um, uh, so there's like a human partnership in sanctifying the, the calendar, even though the dates themselves are are not are not for human beings. Um, And the other element of three we experience, right? We're supposed to also like, it's not just the other human involvement is that it, it's, it doesn't come automatically. You can't just, the day has an identity. Human beings are part of the sanctification process because we're in control of our own calendar. We set the calendar. And also we then have to put in our own efforts to like make sure the day feels special, right? So it's Shabbat, what we just talked about, the holidays as well, right? So, um, the rabbis tell us that you have to see yourself on, on Passover as though you left Egypt, right? That that's a personal obligation. You can't just flip the calendar up. Oh, it's Passover today. I'm done. No, you have to like invest some effort and some thought into, um, in, into seeing oneself as a slave newly freed from, you know, from Egypt. Okay. Um, that's also a way in which we also have to partner in giving these holidays and these sacred times, like their, their special character through our own efforts. Okay. Questions, comments? All right, let's quickly do letter B. Uh, I'm gonna do that really fast, okay? And, and then we can, uh, that'll be a good stopping point. Just, here's, here's like the overview of history, okay? The Torah says, um, look up at the new moon and you see a sliver of moon, that's Rosh Chodesh, that's the new month. The system that developed was witnesses would come to the court and they would say, we saw the moon last night. And the court would say, today is the new moon. And if witnesses didn't come because it was cloudy, because they didn't see it or whatever, then the next day would be Rosh Chodesh. The new month would begin on the following date. Sorry, let me take a step back. Do you know how long it takes for the, for the moon to revolve around the, around, this, around the earth? Anyone know? It's uh, about 29 and a half days. Okay, so if there are 30 days in a month and there it takes 29 and a half days for the moon to revolve on the earth, there's a bit of a discrepancy and we resolve that discrepancy by having some days have 29 days and some days having 30 days. And in that way, on average, the month has 29 and a half days. And the way that was manifest in ancient times was witnesses would come and they'd either see the moon and then they'd say, okay, today's the first day of the month, or they wouldn't see the moon, in which case the next day would be the first of the month. Okay, so that's the system that worked in, in ancient times. The system... Um, broke down um, because um, the, the system broke down because of, um, uh, well, well uh, there are a couple, couple of things that, you know, were probably like, one is it took a long time for the news to spread. You wouldn't know when the holidays occur for a long time because messengers would have to be sent out to kind of spread the news, right? So this is the origin of celebrating holidays for an extra day in the diaspora. Right. The court in Jerusalem, they get the word out. People near Jerusalem, they get the word out. But if you're in Babylonia and Syria and Egypt and Turkey, it would take much longer for the news to get out. And so in the diaspora outside the land of Israel, Jewish communities would celebrate the holidays for two days because they weren't really sure when the, when the new month was. And even in Jerusalem, they had to do two days for Rosh Hashanah because Rosh Hashanah is the first of the month. Like if they wait for the witnesses to come, like the witnesses to come at the end of the day, it's too late to say, oh, it's, you know, it's uh, 4 p.m. And actually today's Rosh Hashanah. We have to like do all the Rosh Hashanah liturgy and say all the Rosh Hashanah prayers and, you know, in only two hours before sunset like that, that's not really feasible. So Rosh Hashanah, they did two days in the land of Israel, even in these ancient times. And the practice developed out of the land of Israel to observe two days of the holidays out of just uncertainty of when the holiday really was. Um, eventually, the, uh, the, the decision was made to 
um, um, to set up a fixed calendar with a fixed cycle of 29 and 30 day months. Uh, and that was sort of done in perpetuity. That's what we use now. Even though we still use it, we use a fixed calendar, we still retain the custom of two days of holiday observance in the diaspora. So we retain that old practice, even though it doesn't really quite make so much sense anymore. That's, that's how we roll. Um, the other piece <clears throat> is that the Torah says that Passover should be observed in the springtime. Okay, now, so far so good. Why is that, why is that challenging? Because 12 lunar months of 30 days, sorry, 12 lunar months, half of which are 30 days, half of which are 29 days, brings, comes out to 354 days. And a solar calendar is 365 and a quarter days. So if you just have your lunar calendar, you're gonna lose 11 days every year, okay? The Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. It's 11 days shorter every year, which means that Ramadan occurs 11 days earlier every year. Sometimes it's in the spring. Right now it's in the spring, okay? It'll be 11 days earlier next year. It'll be 11 days earlier the year before. It'll be 11 days earlier, right? Which means in another, whatever, 10 years, it'll be in the winter, um, okay? So that, that's just how, right? But we're supposed to have Passover in the spring. So what they, what they used to do is in Adar, the month before Passover, they'd go out into the field. They would say, it doesn't feel like spring yet. <laughs> we need an extra month. And they would have a second month of Adar, a 13th, so add, add an extra month of the year, and then push off Passover by month so that Passover would occur in the springtime. When we switched the fixed calendar, we just added seven out of every 19 years, have an extra month of Adar, and seven times 30, times 19, right? If you do the math, it comes out, you know, 365 and a quarter times 19 equals, you know, 354 times whatever, plus 370, you know, the, the numbers work out. It's a 19 year cycle where um, our lunar calendar with the added months, seven out of every 19 years, corresponds exactly to the solar calendar of 364 and a quarter days. Um, and that's how we're, we keep our calendar the holidays and the seasons where they're supposed to be in the Torah, a lunar calendar, um, and, and, and we do that at the same, the same time. So questions, comments? That was a lot of, of background, a lot of history. I did that very fast. Um, at four and five, I'll just say, Birkat HaChodesh and Kiddush Levana. Birkat HaChodesh is a blessing we say in the synagogue on a Saturday Shabbat before the new month just like a prayer that like the month is going to begin. And we announce in the synagogue, the Rosh Chodesh, the first of the next month will be on Friday. And we kind of just lay that out there. And that, that scan that's sort of declaring the month, okay? Sort of uh, reminiscent of what was done in the temple where the court would declare the new, the new moon. Uh, they would do it because witnesses came and saw the new moon in the sky the night before. We do it in anticipation with our fixed calendar. Rosh Chodesh is going to be on Friday based on our, you know, astronomy. Okay, Kiddush Levana is a blessing we say after we see the new moon growing in the sky, we go out on Saturday night still wearing our nice Sabbath clothes and in our fancy Shabbos clothing, we say a blessing that, you know, of excitement seeing the moon growing and what that symbolizes for the potential for rebirth and renewal, okay? Okay, I think we'll pause here. We made our way all the way through letter B, okay? Roman numeral three B, that's really impressive, okay? I think the next time we can meet, we can, let's try, I think we can meet again on Monday, August 1st at the same time. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to put that in. Um, All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna end the recording.